throughout the course of history, men and women have lived and died. Looking back from this place in time, it is clear that people long ago really did some really dumb things. And in order to understand how they died, we must first understand how they lived. These are the stories of how they died. On April 15, 1912, the RMS Titanic sank to the bottom of the Northern Atlantic Ocean. Although this was not the worst tragedy to happen at sea, it has become the most famous. But this is not really the story about a sinking ship. Well, not entirely. This is the story of a man who, through courage and grace, tried to save as many lives as he could with no regard for his own life. Thomas Andrews was born into a prominent family on February 7, 1873, near Belfast in Northern Ireland. The Andrews family were considered to be titans of the thriving linen industry of Northern Ireland, and Thomas's uncle, Lord Peary, was head owner of the Belfast shipping company Harland and Wolf. It was from his uncle that Thomas developed a fascination with ocean liners. When Thomas was 16, he left school for an apprenticeship at Harland and Wolf. Andrews was considered hardworking and was well liked, and from 1889 to 1894, he rose quickly within the company. In the late 1890s, he headed the repair department. Thomas was now directly involved in the construction of numerous vessels, including the Baltic and the Oceanic. Thomas knew the ships from bow to stern and bridge to keel and he was becoming very well known for his innovative designs. Later, he was promoted to chief of the design department. Soon after, Thomas became managing director of Harland and Wolf. In addition, he was a member of various organizations, including the Royal Institution of Naval Architects. In 1907, the White Star Line decided to create a class of luxury liners and Harland and Wolf was hired to design and construct these ships. Thomas Andrews became the main designer of three sister ships, the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Britannic. Upon the completion of the ships, they became arguably the largest and most luxurious ocean liners of their time. It would come to pass that all three of these ships would be destined for disaster. As part of the final plans that was included in the design of these ships were 16 watertight compartments that featured doors that could be closed from the bridge, sailing off these compartments if necessary. Up to four compartments could flood and the ships would still be able to stay afloat. This system, in part, led the White Star Line to describe the vessels as practically unsinkable. Andrews knew that the ships were not unsinkable and argued that the ships should have 48 lifeboats. However, the executives of the White Star Line overruled Andrews, claiming that the extra lifeboats would make the deck look too cluttered and block the view of the first-class passengers as they strolled about the ship's deck. So, the Titanic was only equipped with 20 lifeboats, 16 wooden boats, and 4 collapsible boats. Lifeboats that could hold a total of 1,178 people, only about half of the number that would actually be aboard during her maiden voyage. As chief of the Guarantee Group, a group that was made up of the best and brightest engineers at Harland & Wolf, Thomas made it the group's mission to travel on the maiden voyage of all of his company's vessels. The group would record any improvements or corrections that needed to be made to the ships. 
They would also keep records of the ship's workings. On April 10, 1912, Andrews left his wife and daughter in Belfast and joined the rest of the Harland and Wolfe group to travel to Southampton on the Titanic for the beginning of her maiden voyage. During the voyage, Andrews took notes on various improvements he felt were needed. Most of the notes were primarily cosmetic changes to various facilities on the ship. On April 14th, Andrews even remarked to a friend that Titanic was as nearly perfect as the human mind could make her. Perhaps he spoke too soon. Andrews had been in his cabin planning out the changes he wanted to make when, at 11.40 p.m., Titanic struck an iceberg on the ship's starboard side. He barely noticed the collision. It wasn't until Captain Edward J. Smith summoned Andrews to the bridge that he even imagined that something could be very wrong. Andrews assessed the damage to the ship's hull and determined that six of the ship's 16 watertight compartments were rapidly flooding. This was more than the four that the vessel was supposed to withstand. He relayed this information to Captain Smith and stated that it was with a mathematical certainty that the ship would sink. Andrews also added that in his opinion, Titanic would be on the bottom of the ocean in a mere two hours. As the evacuation began, Andrews informed the captain that there were not enough lifeboats for the number of passengers and crew that were aboard the ship. Despite the captain's experience with sailing, this was his first ever crisis and upon realizing that the ship would sink and that there were not enough lifeboats, he went into a state of shock and became practically useless in the evacuation. The first class stewards provided hands-on assistance with helping their passengers to get dressed and bringing them out onto the boat deck. Unfortunately, the second class stewards focused their efforts to throwing open doors and yelling at their passengers to put on their life belts and to come outside. However, the third class passengers were left to their own devices after being informed of the need to come up on deck. Because Titanic was advertised by the White Star Line as being an unsinkable ship, many passengers and crew refused to believe that there was a problem. The passengers were told that the ship was sinking, though few of them even noticed that she was listing to the right. Andrews was fully aware of the little time the ship had left and that there was a lack of lifeboat space for all of the passengers and crew. However, he continued to urge reluctant people to get into the lifeboats in the vain hope of filling them with as many people as possible. Accounts of Thomas Andrews' final moments vary, but the one thing that they all have in common is that he did try to save as many lives as he could. Witness accounts stated that he was seen advising passengers to get into heavy clothing and to prepare to leave the ship. Others stated that Andrews tirelessly searched staterooms, imploring passengers to put on their life belts and to go up on deck. Many survivors testified to have met or to have spotted Andrews several times. Some said that the last time they saw Andrews, he was throwing wooden deck chairs and other objects to people already in the icy water. The last sighting of Andrews was reported by John Stewart, a steward on the ship at approximately 2.10 a.m. Stewart stated that Andrews was standing alone in the first class smoking room with his life belt lying on a nearby table. It was reported by Stewart that Andrews was staring at a Norman Wilkinson painting over the fireplace. The painting depicted the entrance to Plymouth Sound. Ironically enough, Plymouth Sound was where Titanic had been expected to visit on her return voyage. Stewart asked him, aren't you even going to have a try for it, Mr. Andrews? However, Andrews did not answer, nor did he move. Now this account may not be entirely accurate 
as Stewart was already aboard the lifeboat at 11.40 a.m. In the end, just over 700 people survived when the RMS Titanic sank and the headline shocked the entire world. The sinking of the Titanic should serve as a cautionary tale about emergency preparedness and procedures. You see, in the early 1900s, in accordance with existing practices, Titanic's lifeboat system was designed only to transport passengers to nearby rescue vessels and to not hold passengers indefinitely. Consequently, Titanic sank quickly and help was still hours away. In the United States, due to some misinformation and confusion, morning headlines of many newspapers reported that the Titanic had in fact collided with an iceberg, but those headlines also stated that all passengers were saved. Some papers even reported that the ship was damaged, but it was still afloat or in tow. It really gives meaning to the statement fake news. Upon hearing the actual news by April 16th, people were outraged over the lack of lifeboats lax regulations, and the unequal treatment of the three passenger classes during the evacuation. Many inquiries were launched to discover why so many people lost their lives. Finally, in 1914, the International Convention for Safety of Life at Sea was established and many changes were made to maritime regulations. When Titanic foundered at 2.20 a.m. on April 15, 1912, Thomas Andrews perished along with more than 1,500 other souls. His body was never recovered, but the tales of his grace, intellect, and courage should ever live on. So whose story would you like to know? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to hear more stories of how they died, please give this video a thumbs up, click that subscribe button, and turn on the notifications so you never miss a new video, and I will talk to you next time. Bye guys.